I want to tell you about a feud I got into with Nasim Nicholas Talib, the black swan guy. You've heard of him. Yeah. Anyway, it was about two years ago I got into a feud with him. That's probably a, a grandiose word. Uh, but what happened was this. Some friends of his and he, about four of them, they wrote a paper, an open letter called, I'm going to do a lot of quoting so I have to write this stuff down, Climate Models and Precautionary Measures. Now, in this paper, the quartet noted that the debate around global warming focused on the goodness uh, of the climate models. Those who said the climate models, the GCMs, were good, wanted to have immediate action because the models were predicting doom and uh, destruction. Those who said the models had no skill said there's no evidence that anything needed to be done. Well, okay. But Taleb said, uh, model accuracy is irrelevant. Why? Because, he said, we only have one planet. <laughs> and because, quote, it is at the core of both scientific decision making and ancestral wisdom to take seriously absence of evidence when the consequences of an action can be large. Take seriously absence of evidence when the consequences of an action can be large. Yes, yes, yes. And, quote, the burden of proof of absence of harm is on those who would deny it. Thus, we ought to take those measures that I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes to save the planet. Okay? Well, think carefully about his reasoning. You've got to think real carefully about this. Now, one, we must take seriously the absence of evidence when the consequences of an event are large. And two, again, the burden of proof on the absence of harm is on those who would deny it. Okay, all right. So it's true, it's logically possible, it's a contingent thing, that hostile aliens from space, uh, I call them black swan aliens, <laughs> might attack and destroy the planet. Right. The aliens are going to find us because the Earth uh, emits a constant uh, uh, glow of electromagnetic radiation that's caused by all of our electronic apparatuses. We hum like a giant radio in space, actually, and this is true. So when the aliens get here, when they discover us, you know, whammo, we're all goners. This is it. Now, the consequences of this attack uh, compared to global warming are, are nothing. I mean, global warming is spilled milk next to the complete and utter destruction we're going to face when the aliens get here. All right. So there's no proof these aliens are going to attack. Uh, there's no evidence. But Taleb says uh, we have to take seriously this absence of evidence when the stakes are large, and they don't come any larger than this. So we must now prevent this terrible thing from happening. How do we prevent it? Well, we need to shut off immediately all electronic emissions. <laughs> no lights, no radio, no satellites, no television, no computers. No pacemakers, I suppose, no uh, CPAP devices, whatever we've been seeing around. All that stuff has to go. And if we don't, we're exposing ourselves to the aliens. We need to run like those submarines in those old World War II movies, electronically speaking, you know, run silent, run deep. And uh, any EM leakage at all is going to allow the aliens to discover us. And when they do, we're nothing but probe fodder. This gentleman right here seems to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you may have a story. All right. Uh, well, as a precaution against this attack, we must spare no effort and spare no expense. Uh, we need to shut it down, and we need to shut it all down instantly. And then, well, let Caleb deny it if he can. After all, the burden of proof on the absence of these harms is on those who would deny it. Well, I pointed these facts out to, the, to Taleb in a stream article, Attack of the Black Swans from Outer Space. I kindly provided a copy of this to Taleb and uh, his friends so he could ponder his philosophy in action. 
Uh, that's when he blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> Whoa, you did? I had known him for a while before this, but now he doesn't speak to me. Yeah. So his argument is actually old, and it goes by the name the precautionary principle. Yeah, You've heard of this. Otherwise known as, what about the children? <laughs> so those who hold with the precautionary principle say that if a bad thing can happen, then that bad thing must be protected against. Better safe than sorry. Well, that reminds me of the definition of a sweater. You've heard this, the definition of a sweater, the precautionary principle. A sweater is an article of clothing a child puts on when the mother gets cold. And so that's kind of what these precautionary people are asking us to do. When they get agitated by a theory, they're asking us to put on their sweaters and pay for the privilege. Of course, precaution is not a reasonable argument at all. It's, in fact, it's trivially disproved, and I'm going to teach you how to do so. The list of things that could kill you, or all of us, is infinite. This is true. Each of these things, any logical possible thing, any contingent thing, uh, must therefore be protected against if we believe and hold with the precautionary principle. Well, since the list of things that we must take precautions against are infinite, we're paralyzed. We can't do anything. So you might think, well, you want to take a walk after this talk, or probably more likely during this talk. Well, you go outside, a, a bus could run into a cab, the cab could jump the curb, and pfft, that's the end of Willie. Or you might think staying here, taking a short little nap might be just the thing. All right, well, you do that, one of these fixtures from above might uh, plunge from the ceiling and right into your skull, and that's it. Or if you're in the state of California, you might think you'll breathe, take a breath in. You might inhale some of this deadly PM 2.5 we've talked about, and that's the end of you. And if you hold your breath, you're going to asphyxiate. So there's nowhere that's safe. There's no amount of precaution that you could take uh, to save you from harm. Now, what they do, and the precautionary people know this. They know this, this counter-argument, so they think, you know, well... We can rescue the precautionary principle by saying it's only those threats which are plausible which need to be protected against. Well, this move fails because to say a thing is plausible means you make the assumptions that make it probable. And it's the assumptions that I'm going to prove to you that are always in dispute. For instance, I could easily assume assumptions that uh, prove the black swan aliens are going to attack. So this was in the paper a week or two ago or a month ago. These uh, scientists at one radio telescope discovered some mysterious, uh, unexplainable signals. They thought perhaps they could be alien life. Well, I can explain them. It's obviously the black swan aliens communicating with the mother ship, which is hiding behind the moon, which when the eclipse happens here next week, is the signal they're going to attack. Well, hey, why not? You have no proof I'm wrong. And that's it. You can argue against my assumption. But that's the point. It's always the assumptions that are the point. And it's never the horrible event. Everybody understands what the alien attack means. Everybody. Just as everybody understands what runaway global warming of doom means. Both will end life as we know it. That's what they say. The consequences of the evil are always well understood. Now that means, it sh as it should have been clear from the start, that it's always the assumptions. And another word for assumptions are theory or model. And I'm going to have a lot more to say about theory and model in a few minutes. So what people like Taleb and other precautionary principle supporters are trying to do is cheating. They're, they're assuming the validity of their theory, and de they're denigrating my alien attack theory without any argument except prejudice. They're trying to slip their theory past your gates and get you talking only about the consequences and not the theory's validity. And it's worse than it sounds. It's worse than it sounds because people invariably invoke the precautionary principle to, uh, to, to, to try to get people to... Uh, some expensive power accumulating or uh, expensive ploy that they want to have. But what the folks like Taleb don't realize is if they get their way, we could turn the principle around and use it against them. 
So, people who want to save the planet, they're always advocating these bizarre uh, things, like creating an army, an army of short people. And I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. This is true. This miniaturization of mankind, you know, it might uh, somehow lower the mean average temperature of the globe by a tenth of a degree. Who knows? I don't know. But is it possible that shrinking people by forced genetic manipulation might, just might, have untoward, unpredicted effects? Maybe? Yeah? Okay. So I speak of the doctrine of unexpected consequences, otherwise known as, and summed up in the well-known phrase, what could go wrong? That's the problem we're dealing with here. So I'll give you just two silly examples. Uh, practical, ubiquitous electrification has done a lot of good. It, you know, we're able to broadcast this, record this thing right here. But it's also caused, what they didn't foresee, uh, soul-destroying, peace-wrecking music, which is attacking us wherever we go. You can't escape from it in any public place. And this is brought to us by the benefits of electricity. The Internet is another great thing. Uh, we've learned through the Internet, uh, especially here in the West, what the media really is, what they really stand for, what their true beliefs are, and thank God for that. But the Internet has also made us dumber. Uh, we can't rely on our memories like we used to. And if it can't be looked up in five minutes, it may as well not exist. And this is a problem, too. So here I'm going to read this quote to you. The late and mostly great philosopher David Stove, and if you haven't read David Stove, I, uh, I admonish you to, because he is a wonderful philosopher uh, with a cutting, cutting wit. And he has an essay called Why You Should Be a Conservative. And in this essay, he said that the oldest and best argument for conservatism is, is that our actions almost always have unforeseen and unfortunate consequences. This is an argument from so great a fund of experience that nothing can rationally outweigh it. Yet, somehow, at any rate in societies like ours, this argument is never given its due weight. When what is called a reform proves yet to be, yet again, a cure worse than the disease, the assumption is always that what is needed is still more and still more drastic reform. That certainly sums up our government, I think, in, in the West and in Europe. So human behavior is hideously complex. Nobody is consistently good at predicting it. But uh, this doesn't stop the politician or the activist from throwing over uh, centuries of tradition to employ some new scheme that they just know is going to save us all, and that won't have any untoward consequences. Well, Robert Burns knew the doctrine of unexpected consequences very well. Everybody knows the poem, To a Mouse. The, the, famous, pac the, the famous passages, but mousy thou art no thy lane, in proving foresight may be vain, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay, and leave us naught but grief and pain for promised joy. That's old wisdom, that's it, that's it, but it does not stop us. No one, and everybody here will be nodding our heads, but we can't get people to have this lesson stick with them, and it just doesn't, doesn't seem to be possible in our culture. Well, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of these schemes. These people who are well-credentialed, they have lots of academic uh, experience and, uh, and, and degrees and are employed at prestigious university, and they're well-funded, propose some of the most preposterous, uh, you know, foolish and idiotic schemes that are going to save us. You can't even open up some environmental journals these days without thinking you're looking at movie treatments for 1950s science fiction B-movies. So here, this is my favorite example. There's this, this is a true example. This NYU professor named Lau. He's a short guy, little guy, short professor. This is important. He wants to shrink mankind. He wants to shrink mankind so that big, ma big men like me can't dominate little guys like him. His argument is this. Yeah, I knew Joe would be there. Yeah, Joe, come on. You're Joe, you're first on the list. <laughs> well, look, look, Joe, Joe and I eat more than uh, probably the rest of you, ceteris paribus. And 
you know, all things equal, and uh, therefore big men consume more plants and animals, and more plants and animals mean greater carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So if we could shrink mankind, we'd have less carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. That's his argument. This was made in a peer-reviewed journal. So how, how's Lao going to midgetify <laughs> mankind? Via, quote, pre-implementation genetic diagnosis. Wow. Pre-implementation genetic diagnosis. A process which involves, quote, rethinking the criteria for selecting which embryos to implant. Well, it's a, Lau is obviously a dedicated follower of Aldous Huxley's uh, Brave New World. Uh, well, of course, genetics is not a precise science, though, and it's not clear what he advocates for those people who slide through and turn out tall. Uh, it's going to happen, so perhaps uh, po post-birth abortions. Post, I, I, I want to make sure that, that sinks in. Post-birth abortions, these are being <laughs> talked about. Yes, has anybody heard of Jerry Coyne? Evolution is true, Jerry Coyne. He came out uh, two weeks ago in favor of post-birth abortions. Uh, various philosophers, academic philosophers, of course, have pushed this idea and are pushing this idea, and the idea is on the increase. People whose lives are not worthy of living in this utilitarian fashion, they want to ice at the beginning and at the end of life. This explains, incidentally, the cult of health that we see around us. Everybody needs to be at this peak fitness of, uh, peak optimum of health, whatever they're defining health to be. And anybody who doesn't make that cut, out they go. So that's a really draconian and strict, you know, it does follow from utilitarian theory, but that's the direction we're going. Ah, well, Lau intimates that only dumb people have many kids. So, how do we solve that? Quote, cognitive enhancement. <laughs> this will lower birth rates. He says, quote, many environmental problems seem to be exacerbated by, or perhaps even in result from, a lack of appreciation of the value of other life forms and nature itself. Solution? Shoot people up with the, quote, pro-social hormone oxytocin. Am I saying that properly? Doctors, you guys tell me. Is that right? Oxytocin. Oxytocin, my apologies. Or the noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. Or, Joe, this is you, he wants to, uh, we can see this one coming from a mile off, although Lau can probably only see it coming from a <laughs> couple of hundred yards. He wants to reduce testosterone in men. He has it in for us. He has it in for big men. Now, can you imagine the lines outside the government health clinics for your mandatory shots? Does this seem intrusive to you? Because not so, says our little friend. He says, human engineering could be liberty enhancing. Liberty enhancing. Yes, sir, because he says, quote, if we're able to scale the size of human beings, then given the same fixed allocation of greenhouse gas emissions, some families may be able to have more than two children. It's very generous, isn't it, of the government? Well, Lau and his academic colleagues also suggest poisoning the food supply. Well, not so much poisoning the food supply, but poisoning you. They want to wear, have people wear uh, meat patches, somewhat akin to the nicotine patches that some people wear, that would induce mild intolerance by causing the immune system to react against meat proteins. He says, quote, Henceforth, eating eco-unfriendly food would induce unpleasant experiences. Even if the effects do not last a lifetime, the learning effect is likely to persist for a long time. <laughs> you bet it will. Well, that's Lau. Let me read you something here written by uh, one Julia Pongratz of the Carnegie's Institution Department of Global Ecology. <laughs> Genghis Khan and his Mongol hordes had an impact on the global carbon cycle as big as today's annual demand for gasoline. The Black Death, on the other hand, came and went too quickly for it to cause much of a blip in the global carbon budget. Now, both the Mongol horde and the Black Death lasted about a century, 
And the Black Death killed about twice as many people as did the Mongol uh, horde under Genghis Khan, but it didn't kill with the same efficiency as the Mongols. The plague would wander into some area, and you know, depending on its mood, it would kill a few here and kill a few there, but it largely left a lot of survivors behind, and those survivors continued to emit carbon dioxide. Now, contrast that with the Mongols. They would ride into a town and ask the population if it wanted to surrender so that they could be killed in an orderly and straightforward manner. Or if the town was recalcitrant, uh, they would be besieged and uh, killed in a somewhat more rambunctious manner. <laughs> the good thing about this, a good thing about this slaughter, according to Pongrantz, was that when the horde pushed on towards their next set of victims, they left only silence behind. Silence and freshly fertilized ground, covered in tree seeds. Seeds which were able to grow into forests, which sucked CO2 out of the air, thus cooling the planet. Someone said of Pongrance's discovery, quote, Genghis Khan's bloody conquest scrubbed 700 million tons of carbon from the atmosphere as the depopulated land returned to forest. Doesn't that sound nice? Now, again, the Mongols only killed about half as many as the Black Death, but by removing these folks contiguously, unlike the hit-and-miss approach of the plague, quote, there was enough time for the forest to regrow and absorb significant amounts of carbon. Well, Pongrant says, quote, based on the knowledge we have gained from the past, based on the knowledge we have gained, we are now in a position to make land use decisions, you are all have become land use decisions, that will diminish our impact on climate and the carbon cycle. We obviously now know we can't rely on disease to do the work for us, so what do we need? Well, Pongrance did not tell us how she plans to resurrect Genghis Khan, but uh, certainly that might be in the works. Well, look, besides killing people off or preventing their birth or poisoning them or doing something else, scientists have come up with a, a blizzard of different ways that are going to solve our problems. They want to dump uh, stunning massive amounts of fertilizer into the ocean to stimulate plankton growth, and that's going to somehow cool off the planet. Well, they want to dump massive, stunning amounts of sparkly stuff into the stratosphere, and that's going to solve our problems. And the list is endless, or as endless as the grant money is going to make it. Uh, but these folks never pause to consider that they don't know what they're talking about. They do not ever understand of the existence of the doctrine of unexpected consequences. And they always base all of these things, all of these uh, measures, on the idea that their theories are true. So we need to understand why they rely so heavily on theory. What is theory exactly? Can we, can we attack this problem, them, these lunatics, uh, through a better understanding of what they think theory is? Okay. I often say the root of all scientific evil is the love of theory, and this is so. So we have to understand theory. What is then? I'm talking philosophically now. What is a scientific theory? It's very simple. It's only a list of premises, that's it, which contain propositions, assumptions, uh, observations, and the like, from which we deduce statements about the observable universe. That's it. That's all any scientific theory is. A list of premises, and assumptions, observations, whatever you want to call them, from which we deduce statements about observables. That's it. Here's a very simple theory, just to give you an example. Days following hot days are usually hot. Days following hot days are usually hot. This is as fully scientific a theory as that produced by the, the most expensive grant at the top indoctrination center in the country. <laughs> and it's... From, the, from our humble theory, and given the observation which is true, today is hot, we deduce that tomorrow is likely to be hot. All right? But there's no quantification. There's no quantification of uh, likely, of hot, or usually, and there's nothing in the world wrong with that. Quantification is not what makes a scientific theory. 
Indeed, the over-quantification and the attempts to quantify the unquantifiable are what can destroy an otherwise workable theory. And that's a whole talk by itself. But our, our humble theory does two things that any good, uh, any good real th scientific theory should, a good scientific theory, I should say. One, it fits past data fairly well. And two, it makes testable predictions. Anybody could use it. Anybody could try it. And if decisions made using our theory work out for some individual, they may want to adopt our theory as their own. But it's not going to work for everybody. Some people need more specificity or exactness in temperature, and so they're not going to adopt our theory. That's perfectly fine. So we may be then tempted to say, since the theory is somewhat plausible and it's, uh, in our experience anyway, a good one, we might want to say our theory is true. Is our theory true? The answer is no. It's not true. This is, this is somewhat subtle here, and I'm going to get to a couple of subtle points, which we absolutely need to have to understand why we can't keep attacking people based on theory. What makes a theory true, and not just good or utilitarian, is when each and every premise in the theory itself is true. In our theory, it's certainly true today's hot, uh, but it's not universally true that days following hot days are usually hot. That premise, that part of our theory, is only likely true itself given other information that we have. So we do not have a true theory. We just merely have a good one. And there's nothing wrong with good theories. And in fact, even, even a stranger statement maybe to some of you, I know of no scientific theory, none, that is true in this absolute sense. To be true, every single premise comprising the theory must be true. I'm just repeating this. Provably true, using a chain of argument that leads back to indubitable axioms and sense impressions. Candidates for true theories, therefore, are simple ones. This is why particle phys physicists are much closer to truth than our fluid physicists. Because the amount of assumptions made and guesses and things that are just plain odd in fluid Fluid physics theories are not anywhere close to being true, but particle physicists try their best to get as much as they can true, but they don't quite get all the way. Now, listen, if this doesn't make sense, you've got to understand true, the word true, is a harsh, brutal, exacting word. Mostly true is not true. It's a little bit false. Math ma mathematicians and metaphysicians, they speak of truth, and, you know, well, they may. But scientists used to, and now they didn't to learn again how to speak in uncertainties. So Richard Feynman said, we all know who Richard Feynman is, he said, quote, when we know that we actually live in uncertainty, then we ought to admit it. It is of great value to realize we do not know the answers. Okay, so let's apply that to what we learned about true and plausible theories. Theories which are not true are thus always in need of fixing in the direction towards truth. And since no scientific theory is true, they all need fixing in this direction. And since that, that means the scientist who says, the scientist who says the debate is over is a bad scientist. There's no other way to put it. Uh, he has confused a likelihood with truth uh, which is a telling mistake, or he has conflated probability with decision, which is a you know, all-too-common mistake. I don't want to paint too bad a picture. One thing immediately follows from learning that all scientific theories are not true, and it's this. All or most scientific theories are not false. False is a very... <laughs> to, to prove a theory false, uh, we have to prove at least one of the premises in the theory is itself false. And false is just as concrete and immovable word as true is. And this is be unlikely because blatantly false premises are rarely found in scientific theories. I don't know of any blatantly false premise in most uh, global warming model theories, for instance. Or we have to observe something the theory said was impossible. And uh, when I say impossible, I mean exactly that. Not just a little likelihood, but absolutely impossible in the metaphysical sense.
Let me just give you an example about why falsifiability is not what we should be attacking. So the weatherman that says tomorrow's high will be 88 degrees is not falsified when we measure the temperature of 89. That's because everybody, including the weatherman, including the listeners, all knew there was an unquantified plus or minus buried in his statement. We didn't have to quantify it exactly, but everybody knows it's there. And every scientific theory I know has that same fuzz built into it. So we're not going to be able to find falsification for these things. True falsification in a theory is as rare as a bureaucracy closing because they said they have completed their mission. It's not going to happen. So since truth and falsity are not real, these are our final goals. We really want to know whether any theory is true in this uh, mathematical or a metaphysical sense. That's what we really want to know. Or we want to know it's really false. That's our goal. But that's not a practical goal for most things. So what can we use to judge most scientific theories? And there's only one thing, usefulness. Usefulness. That's what Fra Francis Bacon said when he started the scientific revolution, as a matter of fact. We need to look for those things we can, are useful and, and can control. That doesn't mean we understand uh, the theory behind them, per se, or the cause. All right. Let me give you an example, just to remind us. Scientific theories make statements about observables. Astrology makes statements about observables. Therefore, astrology is a science. This is true. It's not a very good science, but it is a science. David Berlinski, uh, another author, I don't know if you've read before, another author I highly recommend, he makes this point in the book, The Secrets of the Vaulted Sky, Astrology and the Art of Prediction. Well, Bigfootology or Xenobiology uh, is also a science because it makes predictions about observables. Parapsychology is a science, so is climatology a science, so is, well, inorganic chemistry, anything. Homeopathy, any, any theory that makes predictions about observables is a science. Some are good, some are bad. Why do we say astrology is bad and some of these others good? Why do we say that? Well, uh, an astrological theory makes statements like this. Given that the moon is in the house of Mars and Venus is rising and that you were born on this certain date, this week you will experience greater fortitude. Okay, we've all seen things like this. The theory, is that set of starry rules about Mars and Venus and so forth and the observation of your birthday. The deduced prediction is greater fortitude, so there's our scientific theory. Now in that theory, just as in the humble theory that we started with, there's no sense of cause of the greater fortitude. We don't know what's causing any of this. Uh, except by pointing to the rules themselves, which have nothing or very little to say about the cause. Maybe something like uh, Mars is uh, the god of war, and in war you need greater fortitude. But that's very, very flimsy. And in fact, scientific theories do not have to say anything about cause, although that's the final goal of any theory. Every citizen before Newton knew to duck when throwing a rock up in the air. And they were going on nothing more than the empirical, i.e. non-causal scientific theory, what goes up must come down. Well, Newton and Einstein after him and whoever comes after him uh, did not obviate or destroy this citizen's simple theory. This theory, this what goes up must come down, remains as predictively accurate for us as it did for people in the Middle Ages. And it will remain that way until the last rock is thrown. Our theories do not suddenly make rocks descend at different rates. Our theories do not make the universe. It's the other way around. So what can we do with this astrological theory that we suspect? We can't falsify it. There's no way to check the premises of, any, uh, of our theory. The moon and the house of Mars or Venus, whatever, they are stated as true and they're believed as true. And there's no way to falsify them. They're accepted or rejected based on prejudice. All we can do is go on the predictions themselves and see how useful this theory is. Well, 
And I'm asking you in the back of your minds to think about uh, the, your, your favorite models in your own professions. Now, ask somebody, ask anybody, if they've experienced greater fortitude in the last week. And just to be cooperative, they might say yes. They might recall some you know, confirming instance. Maybe I didn't scream when I saw a cockroach or something. All right, and that'll confirm the thing. And if they knew about the astrological prediction, they're going to look very hard indeed for this confirming instance. They're going to search for it, and they're going to find it. Almost always, they'll discover it. Now, given their discovery, that the astrological theory, therefore, has made an accurate prediction. It has. And therefore, there's not only no reason to doubt the theory, but there's every reason to believe it. This is rational, too, as far as it goes, and it's the reason astrology is still with us and ever will be with us. Now, I, I'm assuming all of us, or most of us, know there are better ways to test astrological theory and why we know astrology is not a great science. I mean, we can make predictions specified with exactitude so that they can be verified unambiguously. We need to spell out in advance just what fortitude is and what fortitude is not. And we need to keep these predictions hidden from the people. Now, there's lots of niceties to this and uh, you know, more details that we can ignore, but you guys all get the idea. So have we answered why astrology is a bad science? You know, kind of. Uh, we didn't state the fault, the true fault, which is ambiguity. This is the telling part. It's not just astrology. This is all the environmental models, too. It's ambiguity. It's the ambiguity of the predictions which maddens. A skeptic is going to hear the forecast of greater fortitude and find just as many instances of its lack as the believer is going to find instances of its presence. And both are going to be exasperated that the other can't see where they're coming from. This is why dissuading the astrology believer is a Herculean task. Uh, to do it, we have to endeavor on a complete, thorough disquisition on the nature of evidence. We're going to have to demonstrate uh, how resolving ambiguity casts doubt on the, on the theory's veracity. We're going to have to wade through mountains of case studies. We're going to have to think very deeply about the nature of cosmological cause and, and these astrological predictions. And even then, even after all that work, that tiring, tiring work, the believer is going to have two things to which he may always cling. One, we will have not proven the theory false. The theory is incapable of falsification. It cannot be proved false. The premises are such that they may always be believed. And two, even after removing all ambiguity, the, uh, we're, we're going to be confronted by those times in which the astrological forecasts were accurate. Monkeys throwing darts can predict stocks. Now, it's no use putting these hits down to chance. There is no such thing as chance. Statistics going over this stuff will not save you. Statistics and probability have nothing to say about cause. So you can't look to that. I wrote a whole book on this called Uncertainty that uh, proves these things. There are going to be times when the astrological theory was right, and there must be some real, actual reason why they were right. And that reason, that reason might be the astrological theory was true. You cannot prove. And prove is another one of these adamantine words that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. This is the kicker, and this is a point that Dick Lindzen is always making too. The only real hope you have to, of converting the believer is to change his metaphysical perspective. He believes astrology because he believes it is possible for the stars, or the universe, or whatever, to cause changes in his behavior and demeanor. That's something he wants to believe. To dissuade him from this means replacing that, medical physical, that metaphysical position with another. You can't leave a hole. It has to be filled. 
And you could try the, the sort of rank and ultimately unsatisfactory materialism of the scientist. That's not going to answer the questions he wants. Or perhaps you could try the living religion of a theist. Everybody knows how difficult a task it is to get somebody to change their religion. Sometimes it takes a miracle. Well, what holds for theories of environment, uh, for astrology, holds for theories of environmental doom? I think most people know Tony Heller in his blog, uh, Real Climate Scientist. He documents these failed predictions of doomsayers. In 1992, the warning was uh, for an ever widening ozone hole. Everybody remember that? I quote, alarming threat, which quote, caused the degradation of the conditions necessary to sustain life on the planet. One scientist rang the familiar cry, it's far worse than we thought. Uh, then came the hard data showing the size of the hole. Had been pretty much unchanged since 1990. Sometimes it's a little bigger, sometimes it's a little smaller. And it must have been awfully disappointing to those people who believed to see this data. Well, everybody also knows Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich in 1970 said, quote, the death rate will increase until at least 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving to death during the next 10 years. This did not happen. Well, something like the opposite of it did, of course. Agricultural production has been rising ever since. But was Ehrlich's theory falsified? You may be tempted to say yes, but no, it was not. Was, global, was the theory about the ever-shrinking ozone hole falsified? No, it was not. Well, how about global warming of doom? No, and I'll tell you why. It could be. And Ehrlich makes this very claim, he makes it to this day, that we have not yet reached the doom of which he spoke. We all knew there was fuzz surrounding his dates. Everybody knew that. And therefore, we have not yet got there. We're just a little bit wider on the fuzz than we first thought. Mass starvation is a live possibility. The ozone might flee forever. The globe could burn up. All of it might still happen. Just as we might ex experience greater fortitude when the astrological prediction horoscope says so. So how do we convince believers, though, that these are all bad theories? Well, we're back to the same problem. We could, we could and we should and we must uh, lead these believers through lectures on the nature of evidence, as we saw this morning, on what ambiguity means and how to resolve it in relation to their uh, forecast, as we did with the astrologer. We should tell scientists uh, who believe in environmental doom that their models have no skill and what that means. We could show them that other theories make superior predictions. But like with the astrologer, will never be able to falsify their theories. And there will always be times and places, just as with the astrology, localizations where their theories score small hits. It will always be possible for folks to retain a tight grip on their cherished beliefs if this is what they want. So, again, just as with the astrologer, changing their mind requires changing their most fundamental beliefs. They must come to a new metaphysical view of the world. They must come to a new religion, one in which it makes their heart sing to hear, go forth and multiply, instead of causing them to come to tears. And that may well take a miracle. And that's it. Thank you very much. So it gets kind of scary now. We need a band together, Joe, you and me. Oh, I know. But uh, I've actually lived through, over the course of six weeks, what you described. I was sent to what I called Advanced Charm School, which was six weeks at Wharton on how to run a, a global business. So we were divided up into teams, and each of us was given a problem to work. And guess what our problem was? the role of managing CO2 for a large energy producer on a global basis facing climate change. So I was the only American in our group of six. They were all European managers from elsewhere in the globe. And, you know, I said, oh, wait a minute. 
you know, we're taught to think broadly, and then we funnel down. So we're writing all the statements, and I said, what about if this whole entire thing is not valid? What? Whole entire thing about the relationship between CO2 and global warming is not valid. Ah, excellent. Um, you would think I had just, in, in the middle of, I was raised Roman Catholic, so in catechism school, I would have said this whole God thing is a bunch of hooey. That was the reaction. It was profound. But they entertained us. And fortunately, we had with us a representative from Penn, and she said, oh, you know Dr. Bob Gigengack? I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. Look him up. He's excellent. She goes, our world's most famous paleoclimatologist on the staff here at Penn. Would you guys like to have lunch with him? I said, sure. Great. So two days later, we're having lunch with Bob, and he opens up with who has seen Al Gore's movie An Inconvenient Truth. Most of us raise our hands, and he goes, oh, amazing piece, amazing piece. And I'm like going, oh, God. And he goes, amazing piece if you want to find a vehicle to make yourself relevant again. Other than that, total baloney. <laughs> and, and he walked through the Malinkovich cycles. He walked through everything. And it was, I, was, I was just thrilled to sit there and, and watch Dr. Bob go over all this. Long story short, I then asked him the question. I says, all right. Fired? Long story short, I then asked him the question. What if you are right, and my hope is right, and this is not something we as a company need to deal with? What's the probability of that? Oh, he was instant in his response. Absolute zero, absolute zero. He says, when I go over this with my students, I have them literally breaking down in class because I am going against the cause. You are fighting religion, and That's you're going to have to deal with it one way or the other, and don't let facts get in the way. That's your challenge. And that, I think, sums up let, what... Let me, uh, Joe's point's excellent. Here's something you can always do. This, this is always telling. If you find somebody, you're in a debate with somebody, uh, and they're a true believer on these environmental doom, theories of environmental doom, ask them this. A good scientist would be able to answer it. What would make you change your mind? What exact evidence? I'm not saying the evidence exists or can exist or would, but what would make you change your mind? Would removing this part of the theory change your mind? Would removing this part of the theory, would anything change your mind? And if they can't answer that, and most can't, they'll change the subject or run away, you know you're dealing with a true believer. It is just fundamentally true. And that is also uh, a logical response, if you like it. It's a rational response. Because if you really are dealing with truth, capital T, truth, and you've got a piece of real truth, then nothing can make you change your mind about that truth. But unfortunately, with scientific theories, we're always talking about the contingent. And so there's always that wiggle room. There should be. And we really then have, I opened this question up many times on my blog, and as true believers never will answer it. They, they won't come to it. They just can't see it. So again, it is a, it is a religion, and we have to attack it on that basis. You're right. The true believers walk away more often than not. Uh, you said that uh, a scientist that says the science is settled is a bad scientist. That is not true. He's not a scientist. Well, <laughs> He's not any kind of scientist, not even a bad one. I mean, bad scientists can make mistakes, but that guy ain't one. Uh, ozone. The ozone scam was brought out by the companies that had the patent on R12, the patent had run out, it was selling for almost nothing, and they had to get it off the market. So they, hey, they promoted that hoax to get R12 off the market so they could come out with their new product that had a patent. That's my theory. <laughs> Sounds plausible to me. <laughs> <laughs> What's your take in synopsis form of uh, the Black Swan book itself? Uh, well, there's lots of things I disagree with Taleb about probability. Yes. Anything good? My, my, my views are superior and correct, of course, and his are <laughs> inferior I, We and acknowledge wrong. that. Huh? Yes. Yes, you read my book and find out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>